Okay, it's preparing to live stream the meeting. All right, fantastic. We are live on YouTube. And I think we'll just wait about maybe one and a half more minutes and, um, and then we'll get started. So Amalia, are you, um, you're still headed out to, to Greece soon to, to see your family? Yes, um, I haven't been since uh, June 2019. Oh, yeah. um, I'm leaving on Saturday, we'll be arriving on Sunday. My mother is actually joining us for, uh, for this talk. That's um, awesome. Yes. Yes, welcome. Family is is definitely always welcome. I um I sort of desperately want to to visit Greece, but I'm a little embarrassed. But honestly, the main thing I want to do there is eat. I just want to <laughs> travel the, the country eating all of your food. I mean, the amazing sights and the history and all that, sure. But like mostly the food. <laughs> I'm here if you want any tips. I would be super happy to share. As long as they're food related tips. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. There's um, lots of, lots of travel ideas percolating, uh, you know, I think Hopefully for all of us. Yeah. yeah. But it's great that you'll, you'll get to see your family for the first time in a while. And um, yes. once we all got vaccinated and the family, my family could get together. I mean, we're all here in the U S um, it was, it was, it was awesome. It was just so nice to be able to, <laughs> to see them and, it's been a long time so it's really hard when you've got an ocean and a continent I guess in your case <laughs> separating you okay we are at 11 shall we start okay hello everyone thank you for joining us for another session of cell migration seminar uh, if you have been joining us for a while you know the drill please keep yourself muted during the talk if you have any questions please feel free to add it to the chat during the seminar. Uh, if you would like to ask any question yourself, you can type the letter uh, Q and we will call you on after the talk. Uh, with this today, I would first like to introduce Amalia Haji Theodoro from Dr. Julie Theriot's lab at Stanford University. She is currently wrapping up her, her, her PhD and today she will be talking about her PhD work, cooperation, competition and conviction in motile cells. So a very exciting title, Amalia. Uh, she also has part of her work in bioarchive right now, and she just shared with us that it got accepted in Nature Communications as well. So I'll be sharing the link over in the chat. Uh, with this, I give the floor to Amalia. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you today my doctoral work um, in the lab of Julie Terrio. It is truly a privilege. Uh, today, I want to share with you my work on neutrophil decision making and polarity maintenance. Uh, neutrophils are a subtype of white blood cells and among the first responders to a wound. Here, you see neutrophils responding to a laser wound inflicted in a zebrafish tail fin. As neutrophils navigate through this highly complex tissue environment, they often develop multiple competing fronts. This particular um, cell um, developed three fronts and eventually selected to maintain the middle one. Um, how did it come to this decision? So to probe cellular decision-making, we chose to challenge uh, single HL60 neutrophil-like cells with a simplified oval-shaped obstacle positioned symmetrically inside microfluidic channels. Um, as you can see in the movie, the cell responds to the mechanical challenge by creating two equivalent competing fronts. The symmetry breaks when one front starts retracting, allowing the other side to dominate and guide the cell around the obstacle. The cell here is forced to make a choice, not because of an external symmetry. The two fronts are encountering identical chemotactic gradients. Uh, but because of the cell's intrinsic capability to maintain structural integrity. Um, recently, a few other labs have taken similar macrophytic approaches to study how cells make choices. 
we also started working on this a few years um, ago using a different cell line and a different channel geometry. And I'm excited to share with you our findings today. The decision-making process can be broken down into three major phases. First, the cell makes contact with the obstacle. Thereafter, you have the symmetric uh, split of the front. And finally, you have the initiation of the retraction. In trying to assess whether there are small left-right asymmetries that bias the decision, we decided to take an agnostic statistical learning approach. For this, we took uh, row images from our time-lapse movies, capturing different cytoskeletal components, and pre-processed them, scaling, normalizing fluorescent intensities so that we can compare across cells, and then proceeded to extract hundreds of different features uh, using a free open software cell profiler. Uh, this feature is reported on shape, intensity distributions, texture, and granularity. And the next step was to synchronize the data because different cells are deciding with different rates. And, and so we decided to work on a rescale time, interpolating feature value at a fixed number of equidistant points. Um, the next big challenge was how do we select which uh, uh, features to focus on? Because here we have over 700 features and maybe 100 cells. So this problem is over-specified and susceptible to overfitting. To overcome this, uh, we proceeded with a well-established statistical learning uh, method called lasso regularization. This penalty by creation leads to sparsity and gave us only a few tens of features um, to train our binary left-right classification. Um, here, I'm plotting the predictive accuracy for our training and test set. The test set is independent and has never been seen during the training. At the time the cell first makes contact with the obstacle, nothing predicts better with 50% uh, um, accuracy, the direction of the cell. It's completely random. And surprisingly, we can predict the cell's turning direction with accuracy greater than 70% only in the last third of the decision-making process in the highlighted in the yellow shaded region, about 15 seconds before the initiation of the retraction. Um, this is our best model, which I also showed you in the previous slide. This uh, combines features of actin, myosin, and cell shape. And using that, we can predict with um, accuracy greater than 70% up to the fifth interpolated time point before retraction, about 15 seconds. We also interrogated separately actin, myosin, and cell shape features, um, and each individually has poorer predictive power than their combination. Um, and then we turned our attention to other cytoskeletal elements. Combining nucleus, microtubule, and cell shape information takes us back to the third interpolated time point before retraction. And once again, nucleus and microtubules alone um, show less predictive power than their respective combined data set. So overall, our statistical analysis has revealed no early pre-existing asymmetry that biased the cell's uh, direction. And given that the cell itself appears to decide late into the decision-making process, we wondered whether we can bias the cell's uh, direction by making one side a bit stronger. So to influence the cellular decision, um, we leveraged a novel optogenetic tool developed by the Sean Collins lab at UC Davis, um, a tool that enables light-induced phototaxis. So the cells are stably expressing parapinopsin, which is a light-sensitive GL5 family GPCR, and then a spectrally compatible CDC42 FRET biosensor that we use as a readout of uh, front polarity. Here I'm showing a well-polarized cell in the straight part of the channel, and you can appreciate the CDC42 activity profile and the dynamic range uh, for the sensor, which is quite small. Altogether, this system allows direct recording of downstream CDC42 activity in cells whose migration is guided by parapinopsin. So for this experiment, as soon as we detect two competing fronts, we start stimulating continuously the left-hand side. Uh, the, 
the other side is not letting go easily. And about now it starts retracting. Using this continuous stimulation assay, we can bias the direction of um, the cells with 75% success rate. And we were very surprised that the success rate was not higher. We did control experiments and confirmed that over 90% of the cells are expressing the optogenetic construct and are receiving inputs from the receptors. So there are cells that do receive the inputs from the receptors, but they totally ignore them. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about this um, portion of cells later. In addition, we observed that our stimulation does not resolve the competition right away. And this made us question, when does our intervention really matter? So we devised a follow-up experiment, administering five pulses early on and then letting go. And we saw that this early stimulation is insufficient to bias the direction of the cell, um, suggesting that inducing a transient asymmetry is not sufficient to, to drive the system out of its steady state. Uh, we also devised a later stimulation assay, um, beginning the stimulation with the two fronts uh, were 6.6 .6 microns away from the apex of the obstacle. This is three times more extended uh, fronts as in the continuous stimulation assay. And we found that this later stimulation is as sufficient as the continuous stimulation, further supporting that it is this later stimulation that really matters. Now, quantifying CDC42 activity at the two competing fronts in non-stimulated cells, we found that surprisingly, the activity drops in both. So both sides, as the cell stretches out, start experiencing doubt in their conviction of being fronts. And if we compare uh, the non-stimulated cells with cells that received continuous stimulation, um, you can see that in the stimulated cells, the winning side is still dropping, but it's dropping with a slower manner. So we think that through our intervention, we are actually fortifying the stimulated front, uh, decreasing the rate of doubt, if you will. Now, after probing the competition, we turned our attention to the retraction, and we wondered whether we can reverse uh, a cell's decision. For this experiment, we let the cell pick a direction, and once we detect a big retraction, we start continuously stimulating the retracting side. And once again, you see that despite our stimulation, the retracting side keeps retracting, reaching all the way back to the apex of the obstacle. And we keep stimulating, and we keep hoping and hoping. And finally, the, the cell reverses. So we have repeated this experiment over 200 times. And in every single case, the retracting site had to go all the way back to the apex before reprotruding. We also performed a five pulse simulation uh, early on during the retraction. And just like in the competition assay, five pulses did not do anything. And finally, late stimulation after the retraction has been completed is sufficient to rescue the previously retracting front. So we believe that once the cell has made a decision, the losing front enters a refractory period that requires complete retraction to the cell body before stimulation can encourage a new front. And this is suggestive of something actively inhibiting CDC42 activity until the retraction has been completed. Our conceptual model is the following. Initially, both leading edges are committed fronts. And then as the cell extends further, both fronts start experiencing doubt, losing their confidence and open up to new inputs. After the retraction has started, the retracting edge is fully committed to retracting. And upon exiting its retraction program, um, this edge becomes now once again receptive to new inputs. All in all, our optogenetic results have revealed a context-dependent uh, listening to receptor inputs. 
And we wanted to dig a little bit deeper as to why some cells listen and some don't. And why does an individual cell is able to listen for some time, but not all the time? So to probe what is contributing uh, to this selective listening, we turned on a much simpler assay where a cell has only one front and one rear, and we try to reverse it. For this experiment, cells are migrating inside straight channels. There is no bifurcation. And then we locally stimulated the receptors at the cell rear to try to repolarize the cell by 180 degrees. Here you see a successful reversal. When we looked at a population of over uh, 300 cells, we found that only about half of the cells reversed. So just like before in the decision making, there is a big proportion of cells that receive inputs from receptors, but they totally ignore them. And in trying to understand why, we carefully measured the CDC42 activity profiles um, for reversing and non-reversing cells. And when we compared the two, we found that there is a small difference at the cell rear with reversing cells having a little bit more CDC42 activity at their back, a little bit more front character, if you will. Um, and then we also compared speeds and we found that reversing cells tend to be slower migrating cells. So all in all, it seems that cells with weaker polarity are more easily reversed. Uh, these are frames from the movie shown before. Um, we can track the CDC42 activity and at the same time the speed for uh, cells. And when we looked at many of those cells, we found a stereotype sequence of events. We start from a steady state and upon stimulation, the stimulated rear um, quickly assumes front character. Uh, this causes the cell to stretch a bit and upon the stretch response, um, the original front starts shutting off. Interestingly, um, when we look at the centrate speed, the cell immediately slows down upon um, stimulation and the direction of motion flips 27 seconds post stimulation. This is before the CDC42 activity becomes equal at the two poles of the cell. Um, this sequence of events made us wonder whether there is a point of no return. Um, what would happen if we stop stimulating earlier between the two key events of uh, directional flip and equal CDC42 activity? So for this experiment, we delivered 12 pulses rather than the continuous stimulation. And we found that cells can be categorized into four distinct um, behaviors. Um, we found that almost half of the cells show no response whatsoever. They just blow through. And then there are some cells that show a medium response, um, slowing down a bit, stretching of their rear a bit, um, and then um, showing a moderate increase in CDC42 activity at the stimulated rear. Thereafter, there is a very interesting class of cells um, showing a strong response. Um, transitly repolarizing both the direction of motion and their uh, CDC42 polarity axis, but eventually reverting back to their original ones. And finally, only about 6% of the cells are stably reversing. Now, when we compare the chymographs across uh, behaviors at the bottom of the slide, where zero represents the cell rear and one represents the cell front, um, you can appreciate that in the non-responding population, the CDC42 activity at the back, shown in the pink uh, dotted box, is very low. So the key home message for us from this experience, experiment uh, was that a strong rear is refractory to receptor inputs. And then we turned our attention to assess whether we can tune the manability of the cell rear to listen to receptor inputs. A prime candidate that can uh, modulate uh, the strength of the cell rear is the myosin row A activity. Uh, myosin activity is tuned by phosphorylation, which has many upstream regulatory inputs as shown in the diagram. And we can perturb uh, this easily at two places. 
First, using the Y27 compound, which inhibits ROC, lowering phosphorylation and ultimately lowering myosin activity. Conversely, we can use nocotazole, a microtubule depolymerizing agent known to increase myosin phosphorylation uh, and increase myosin activity. So treating cells with these two perturbations, we found that upon Y27 treatment, the proportion of non-responding cells significantly decreases. Well, nocotazole has the exact opposite effect of significantly increasing the proportion of non-responders, suggesting that the sensitivity to receptor inputs does depend on the myosin-2 activity. Now, clearly, myosin-2 activity is functionally important, and we can also measure myosin localization differences in uh, cells expressing fluorescently tagged myosin. So for an untreated cell, um, the log of the front rear myosin ratio is less than zero, meaning that there is more myosin at the back rather than the front. Now upon Y27 treatment, um, this asymmetry gets suppressed. Uh, the ratio is closer to zero. And as you can see from um, the picture, you have equal amounts um, front and back. And finally, upon a cortisol, you see this large pool of myosin at the cell rear. In conclusion, we found that the cell rear can be refractory to receptor inputs, at least at the level of CDC42. Um, moreover, we found that the um, myosin-2 promotes this remarkable front-rear stability by suppressing transmission of receptor inputs at the cell rear. And similarly, our work on decision-making has uh, revealed a context-dependent listening uh, to receptor inputs at the cell front. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share with you my work, uh, my advisor, Julie Terrio, all members of the Terrio Lab, uh, as well as my collaborators and my funding sources. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Amalia, it was wonderful. Uh, I'll start with one of the first questions here from Sam Barnett. Uh, do you think an optogenetic ROA system at the front of the cell would essentially show the opposite results of optogenetic CDC42? It's a great question, actually. Oh, it's a great question. I would love to have such a tool. Uh, I know that there, there are some groups working on such tools, and I'm very excited to see whether um, our understanding and our hypothesis would be uh, confirmed uh, by the experiments. Uh, it's certainly a good conceptual question to, to ponder. Should I go for the next one? Yes. Okay. Um, so the second one is from Sam. Uh, he's asking, I believe CDC42 is upstream of WASP in these cells. Any, any comments on the role of WASP uh, versus wave in neutrophils? Do you think that activating wave or rack upstream would influence decision making? That's another good question. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have on our hands a good reporter for WASP to measure the localization of the behavior during those optogenetic experiments. I know that um, Orion Weiner, among other scientists, have really spent um, a lot of time thinking about the role of WASP and other um, candidates um, in neutrophil uh, migration. Um, so once again, I'm not, I'm not certain we have enough information right now to, um, to answer this a little bit more uh, informative. Um, but there is a central role for WASP in uh, neutrophil migration. Um, I would love to have a reporter and, and put it into the test. Cool. All right. Fantastic. Good. Sorry, I was having audio questions, uh, issues for a second. Thanks, Ankita, for rescuing. Um, the next question is from uh, Cicely uh, McNamara um, asking, what happens at the other end of the obstacle in the first experiment? It looked like the cell returned down the opposite side with no split decision at this point. Is that in fact the case? 
Can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood this. Uh, this is for the decision making where the cells is encountering are encountering those uh, oval shaped obstacles. Um, so yeah, they're wondering um, um, at the other end of the obstacle. Oh, I guess maybe the far end of the obstacle um, saying it mm -hmm. looks like the cell returned it down the opposite side with the no split decision at, at this point. Oh, um, I see. Um, yeah, so the cells in the decision-making process are uh, lured into the channels following uh, FMOP gradients. So there is a strong bias for the cells to keep migrating upwards. Um, the vast majority of the cells, more than 90% of the cells keep migrating up the straight portion of the channel rather than making a circle within the, um, within the obstacle. Um, awesome. um, yeah, so I think that movie might not have been the most representative for uh, the stereotypical uh, behavior after the cell has committed to a choice. It usually migrates up. Okay, so next question is from Abhijit. He's asking uh, if the CDC 42 gradient seems a little shallow, is it the sensor dynamics or is it the sensitive CDC 42 activity? It is the sensor and uh, people that have uh, worked with uh, FRET sensors are, um, are experienced with this challenge. Um, so this particular sensor is um, even uh, more uh, uh, suppressed in its dynamic range as others. However, there was a technical challenge that um, the graduate student in Sean Collins lab had to overcome. George Bell is the one who developed this um, optogenetic tool, uh, he had to match um, a spectrally compatible CDC, uh, uh, CDC42 biosensor with the parapinopsin. And parapinopsin is a cool opsin. It um, turns on uh, with the blue light and turns off with uh, yellow green light. And so you have to be very mindful about what sort of um, sensor you're going to use. Uh, so the the um, uh, CDC 42 fret biosensor that George developed is a tomato katuska. Uh, so in the red, far red, so that you don't, it's spectrally compatible and you don't have any uh, 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 countering effects between the two modules. Awesome, fantastic. Uh, we have a question from M Michael Glotzer. If um, Michael, if you wanna unmute and ask. Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to type into the box. But, um, so it seems like one possibility is that either your probe doesn't activate CC42 quite strongly enough, and maybe if you if it were stronger, it would bias to a greater extent. Or alternatively, yeah. maybe CC42 is is required but not really sufficient, and there's some other cue that's going on PIP2, or I mean, who knows what it what it is? Yes. I mean, how do you? Uh, you, you, yeah, what do you think about those? And I guess maybe yeah. before I finish to let you talk, if you need a tool to activate row, I can, we have those obviously. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I would love that. Um, um, I think um, I have a couple of notes on those questions. They are really good questions. Uh, first of all, first here, there is a small uh, detail where we are not really activating CDC42, but rather we are activating um, the receptors. And then we are using CDC42 as, uh, um, as, our, market, or as our marker for front uh, polarity signaling. Um, we also were thinking that perhaps our stimulation is not um, as um, uh, intense or as repetitive as, as it should. Um, George Bell, who developed the tool, has um, put together beautiful work um, 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 where he has, uh, um, I'm looking for the right word, um, tested different um, intensities and different uh, repetition cycles. Um, this is also an accompanying article just accepted at Nature Communications. I'm happy to share that link as well. So um, from George's work, we know that we have optimized and calibrated this tool to the um, 
to the best extent possible. Um, now, if CDC 42 is the best uh, front marker or the fastest front marker, this is um, open for discussion. There has been work from Sean Collins, um, Tobias Meyer, and um, uh, that showed that CDC 42 does respond faster than RAC. ROA and RAS in neutrophil-like cells when they are uh, polar uh, polarizing de novo and they are um, making turns. However, PEEP3, RAC are also um, beautifully supported in the literature as uh, uh, big uh, components of front signaling. And I think the, the better way to answer this question would be to um, gather data from all reporters and, and try to assess the temporal sequence of events. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think I should take one from YouTube. Um, so did you take into consideration a possible harmful effect of light illumination and cell-like ROS formation at the place of illumination in your experiments? Yes, that is another good question. So um, for that, the, the way we went about it was we did um, control experiments to assess where the viability of cells um, and also um, effects of photo bleaching so that we can account for those um, due to our uh, illumination, both in terms of imaging as well as stimulation. Um, so we carefully control the, the experiments. All right, so um, we do have about three or four more questions, um, although we'll just maybe just do one more um, and, and folks can reach out to you or we can stay afterwards because um, we wanna um, move on to the next talk. But um, a question from uh, Mohammed um, pointing out that there's myosin present at the cell front so how does your um, myosin light chain to phosphorylation dynamics, how do they play out at the cell front in your assay? Mm -hmm. um, so myosin is present um, somewhat at the front because of it's getting clutched on the actin, branched actin at the front. Um, those pharmacological perturbations are obviously global perturbations. Um, so you don't necessarily only affect um, the phosphorylation of myosin activity at one particular domain of the cell, but really on the entirety of the cell. Um, however, those perturbations have revealed this spectrum of behavior. So I did mention in my presentation that you do have this uh, nice, clean antithetical results using Y27 and nocotazole on increasing um, or decreasing the proportion of non-responding cells. Similarly, you have effects in all cl different classes of behaviors. Um, something that I didn't mention and something that you, the people that are interested can uh, um, kind of entertain themselves uh, uh, reading the manuscript is that um, in expressing the myosin phosphorylated light chain construct, the fluorescently tagged uh, myosin construct in cells, we actually saw that this myosin line um, is less responsive than the, than the line with the CDC42 FRET sensor. And so we now have additional confirmation that by this overexpression of myosin, we are actually creating cells less responsive to our um, optogenetic stimulation, which was additional confirmation and maybe a little bit more fine-tuned than the um, drug perturbations, which once again are global. All right, fantastic. Thank you again, Amalia, so much for that really much. wonderful presentation. And we're, we're really excited that your work has just been accepted and um, it'd be great to check it out. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and answer the other remaining questions, feel free to do so in the chat fantastic. as well. I'll do All right, um, and thanks again. So now we're gonna move on to our second speaker of the hour. Um, 
and feel free to start sharing your screen. So next up we have uh, Dr. Jacobo Di Russo. So he studied cell biology in Florence, Italy before moving to the lab of Professor Lydia Sorkin and Munster in Germany as a Marie Curie fellow. Um, there he was studying how the extracellular matrix influences physiological responses. And then in 2015, he joined the laboratory of Professor um, Spatz in the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. Uh, and there he deepened his knowledge of cell adhesion at the biophysical levels. And now uh, since 20. 2019, he's been an independent group leader at the RWTH Aachen University in, German, in Germany. So a uh, tough time to start your own group, um, but we're really here, uh, glad to have him here to present and um, take it away, Jacobo. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. It's uh, very exciting today to share with you um, the work that I actually started as a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg with Professor Joachim Spatz. And I, I keep working on some aspect of this uh, also in my own group at the University of Aachen and the Leibniz Institute for Interactive Material. And I want, what I wanted to share with you today, it's uh, my understanding of, of our understanding of uh, mechanobiology of epithelia in, in, from the point of view of extracellular matrix. So if you want to speak about um, mechanobiology of epithelia, I think it's very important to start characterizing the mechanics of epithelia, so the biomechanics. So if you think in a very simplistic uh, way, the, 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 the units that form of epithelia are si uh, single epithelia cells. So if you put a cell on a, uh, on a um, hydrogel and do traction force microscopy, you see that the, the cells, it's like a fried egg, and you have traction force vector which, in, uh, which uh, are indicating the center, and so the all forces are balanced at the edge. Then if you build up complexity, putting a second cell, obviously the epithelial cells interact to each other, have a, a adhesion, and this adhesion basically make the cells uh, splitting their the forces in a different uh, manner. So you see overall, you have a balance um, force, but uh, if you look at the single cells, the, 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 the traction forces are unbalanced. And this is because overall, basically, the cells support to each other at the cell junction. Then you increase complexity, you put a third cell, and you see that the cell in between is sort of hang up with the, with the, with the neighbors of the outer cells. And, and you can imagine this to be a sort of a supercellular organization where you have traction forces at the edge. Interestingly, if you change the substrate uh, with, uh, for example, the biochemical information that you give to the cell from fibronectin to collagen, you realize that the cell cell forces and the cell extracellular matrix forces are raising in the same manner. And the same happens if you keep the same biochemical information, but you change the mechanical information, so the stiffness of the substrate, and these both uh, rates. So when you look at an epithelium, which is much more complex than three cells, obviously it's important all the time to look at the traction forces and to look at the tension between cells. So, but how is the, the situation in reality? So here, there are epithelial cells monolayer in, um, in, uh, um, in vitro, and you can observe them for a long time and realize that the system is highly heterogeneous. And actually, if you look at the stress distribution, you see that these stresses are heterogeneous everywhere. And you can uh, appreciate that you have this high peak of stresses and low valley somehow of stresses. So if you take the vectors of this uh, uh, stress and you correlate them, you can actually calculate with uh, uh, the autocorrelation function, the correlation length uh, of the system. And you get, for, uh, for example, in this case, under 70 micrometer, which sort of describe the size of group of cells, which cooperate together and uh, build high stress or low stress. So this, we think it's the unit of an epithelial that control that biomechanics. And so interestingly, um, what, we, what we did was to change uh, the, the actomycin contraction with the blebistatin, we reduced the contractility of the epithelia or with calicoline A and the force correlation length follow the, the, the ability of each cells to contract. And, uh, and, and then if you change also the mechanics of the substrate from four kilopascal to 90, so you increase the stiffness, you see the correlation length increase. So the group of cells is highly dependent of the ability of each cells to contract. So this is biomechanics, but mechanobiology 
of course, implement the function of a biological system connected to uh, mechanics. And what we were interested in was to understand uh, a, a basic biological function, which is the collective migration, which is important for wound healing, for, uh, for um, development and many other aspects of our body. And these are keratinocytes which migrate freely on an open space. And there are many interesting things that we can observe. And we, we particularly look at um, these this nice, nice cells at the edge, which drives the whole monolayer uh, going forward. And these are called uh, leader cells. So leader cells form apparently in an unbiased way. So if you have this uh, monolayer of MDCK and you uh, make them make sure that there's no any uh, perturbation of the edge, the cells will appear without any reason apparently. And so the question was, is there any um, uh, rule that command the formation of these leader cells? And so what we did, we look at our uh, favorite uh, biomechanical properties, which is basically this uh, correlation of forces. And then we compare that with the frequency of leader cells at the edge. So we basically calculate the distance between leader cells in a migrating monolayer. And we realized that every time we did in an MDCK or in HACAT cells or two different epithelial um, cell, we didn't see any difference. So we thought, okay, this can be pure chance, yeah, um, uh, is there any correlation? So what we did basically was to go in back in time and try to understand what is going on behind the future leader. And uh, we did then look at forces, we look at traction force and stresses, and we realized that every time the leader was forming before that, there was high traction forces behind the cell, the, the leader cells and high stresses. And in MDCK, you also have this, uh, um, this, this uh, phenomena that you have this fingering basically of the, of the form this formation of fingers from the MDCK and you have the, the, the formation of a second leader. And in also in this case, you have uh, high stress just behind the future leader. And you can see the quantification here. So how stress is commanding the leader formation um, we, we were wondering if actually the, the future followers were pulling kind of the, the future leader in order to tell, okay, you are the leader for us, right? And so to do this experiment, to answer this question, we prepare a PDMS substrate and we basically scratch the surface of this PDMS for forming a, a trench. Then we allow the cells to migrate on top of this trench. And when the first layer of cells overcome the trench, we pull the PDMS substrate. And so what happened basically was to uh, transfer this uh, this increased stress just between follower and a leader, and uh, the, other, uh, the other cells would not feel the same kind of, of stress. So we did that, and you can see from this uh, uh, time frame of the video, uh, upon stress, the, 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 the cells at the edge have this uh, lamellipodia, so they become a sort of leader. And then when the time goes and the monolayer migrate, actually these cells, they come back to become leader, uh, follower. And so the thing is that these the cells are basically the stronger leader and seems that they have a domain behind of the follower. And this domain might be connected to uh, any, uh, so to, to this um, biomechanical characteristic of the monolayer. And so, uh, what I showed you already before, right? We can perturb the correlation length with uh, drugs, with, so with chemical modification or with physical modification, changing the, the mechanics of the uh, of the matrix. And what uh, what happened if you do that? You actually, if you reduce the forces in the system, you have much more leader forming at the edge during migration. And if you increase the forces, the leader cells become less. And you you have you can do that also with the mechanics of the substrate. So from soft to stiff you see stiffer you go, less leader cells you have. This because behind each leader, basically you can propagate the forces in more efficient way. And so you have this kind of uh, correlation of uh, this cooperation between cells that become larger. And so the domain of each leader change. Okay, that was the story that was uh, a few years ago uh, published. And now um, I want to tell you more what we start looking at in a collective migration from a different perspective. And so um, if you, I told you a lot about the leader cells at the edge, but what I found very interesting is also looking just behind at the monolayer migrating what is going on. And so if you take just two random cells and you trap them while migrating, you realize that these cells are not going straight towards the empty space, but they have a sort of oscillatory behavior. And this is the, the case because each cells interact with each other. So every time a cell moves, 
uh, influence enables in the movement because you have increased tensional forces which have a, a, a direction. And so a cell is moving down and the surrounding is following, right? This is possible only because each cell adhere firmly on the substrate and pull uh, themselves uh, forward, right? And so uh, we know that this tension between junction are important in polarizing the cell and told giving the migration direction. And in particular, you have this Merlin protein that detach from the tight junction and regulate the RAC1 gradient in each, in each cells and control the polarization of the cell. But what is not clear or wasn't clear yet how a certain adhesion uh, characteristic can control this tension and so especially the direction of this uh, uh, tension. And so if you look at the wound dealing, we know that the basal keratinocyte upon wounding start migrating in an empty space and they produce a lot of fiber acting. And that's the, the, um, the provisional matrix that they need in order to migrate. And so we thought, okay, let's look how the cells interact with fiber acting. And we know that Two different integral receptors uh, are important for migration. One is the alpha phi beta one integrin, and the other one is alpha V, let's say the alpha V family of integrin. There are many, uh, uh, um, many integrins, uh, alpha V integrin, which are involved in this migration. And the alpha phi beta one is very important for mycin 2 activity and so to produce and develop force in the cell, whereas the alpha V are more important to structure the focal adhesion and also for the, the, the uh, the sense in the stiffness of the substrate. And so we wanted to address only the alpha phi beta one because we were interested in force and one uh, uh, very powerful tool that uh, was present in uh, Joachim Spatz's lab is the, the block of polymer micellar nanolithography in short PCML, which basically allowed you on the surface to distribute gold nanoparticle with different density. So you can see here, it's an homogeneous surface and you can change from 35 to 50 and 70 nanometer spacing. So this you can obtain also on a polyacrylamide hydrogel. So you can change stiffness, you can calculate your forces. And in addition, what you can do, you can use highly specific peptidomimetics which in this case was very specific for alpha phi beta one. And so you can control the distance between integral receptor when you change the density of this, uh, of this substrate. So we did that and we did in our keratinocyte and what we found out that the cells actually do not prefer high density or low density of receptor, but they prefer something which is intermediate. And you can see the efficiency of migration was 50 nanometer the highest. And interestingly, this was not observed, this trend at all, when you use Sakic RGD, which is known to be more engaging alpha V integrin family of uh, uh, so a family receptor. And so, but what about uh, forces? So we look at the stresses, we realize that at the high density and low density of integrin, the first layer of cell kind of accumulate stresses, and this was uh, not somehow efficiently transmitted to the, to the follower, whereas in the 50, this was much more homogeneous the distribution. And so this suggests that there is a kind of impediment in transmitting a stress uh, from, from leader to follower or in general between cells. So to answer this question, we went back to our system property. So we look in the bulk. So any there was no bias in the migratory monolayer. We look at the stresses. And in particular, if you observe the profile of the stress, you realize the 35 and 70 nanometer have these high and thin peaks whereas the 50 nanometer has this white uh, peak. And this was basically uh, quantified by the stress correlation length, which was um, higher in the 50 nanometer, which uh, indicates that each cell is able to kind of uh, dissipate a stress or communicate a stress much in, 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 larger, uh, um, in, in larger group of cells, basically. And this um, was confirmed by looking at the velocity vector of the cell migrating at the edge. So in this case was a migratory uh, system and the cell, so you track the cell velocity and you correlate the vector in the same way you do the, the, with the stress and you see this is always the most efficient. And so another interesting aspect of this was that if you look at the traction force at the absolute values, you don't see that this is the higher traction correspond to the higher correlation length. But you have low traction at 35 and high traction at 70. So somehow this is a distinct, distinct mechanism that is we are speaking about. Um, so the next um, logic question was, what about stiffness? So we know that if you uh, change the, the, the density of integral receptor in single cells, you actually can increase uh, traction force in, uh, in a single cells and also with the stiffness, increasing stiffness, increase traction. 
And so we did our experiment with different traction for uh, with different stiffness from 11 kilopascal to 90 and different uh, density. And we realized that overall, the monolayer increased the speed of migration, which it was expected and well known. But if you look at relative stiffness, you see that the 15 nanometer was always the preferred density of, uh, of receptor. And this was confirmed by uh, also velocity correlation length and the stress correlation length. What something that I noticed and uh, it's worth uh, noticing is that the stress correlation length seems to be very comparable independent of stiffness. Sort of saying that this, this communication between cells, it's not depending on the stiffness, but it's mostly how the integral receptor are organized underneath. And um, this was very, uh, uh, very nice to find because it was also supported by the, the concept that alpha phi beta one is the one that uh, is important for force generation, whereas the alpha V uh, integral family, they are more important for rigidity sensing. In this case, we engage only alpha phi beta one. So this was obviously the, the cells were not able probably to sense the, the stiffness. So um, so what, uh, what, what is happening then in the migration monolayer? Uh, we, we thought, okay, maybe in the 35 and the 70 nanometer, there is a kind of destructive uh, cooperation between cell, which doesn't allow the monolayer to move, whereas in the 50, you have a constructive cooperation, and this allowed the movement. And so we wanted to prove this concept, and for doing that, we just add some uh, uh, DECMA antibody, which is an ecadurine blocking antibody, so you, you can interfere to the communication of mechanics between cells. And so we wanted to know what, what happens, and what happens was that in the 35 and the 70 nanometer, the cells, the monolayer sort of uncage and start migrating, whereas in the 50 nanometer, the, the cells stop migrating. And so this uh, support the idea that you have a destructive mechanism at this level, so the cells are more independent and not very cooperative in order to migrate forward. Um, okay, so I show you now uh, what, what I've done in collective cell migration, and uh, these were mostly in vitro experiments. But I want to share with you some uh, some of the work we are doing here in Aachen, and it will be just a teaser because uh, because of time, and it's not connected to migration per se. And um, we, the question is how this heterogeneity of matrix or, or density of, of receptor is important in a physiological system and in vivo. And we are working in Aachen on a retina system, which has a very nice organization. So if you look at the retina from the top with this conformation, you have the central region, which is very important to get light and get information, whereas the periphery is, is less important, less involved in getting information from the, from, from the eye. And if you look at the epithelium, you have an interesting organization, very honeycomb classic epithelium in the center and the periphery, the cells are much more stretched. So, if you look at the, uh, at the force distribution in this system with this uh, inference tool, you realize that the, the system is very homogeneous in the center, whereas in the periphery, you have much more heterogeneity. And so we look at the matrix, and in particular, the laminin alpha-5, which is a basin membrane component. And you can see from the center, you have very high signal in intensity in the, in the staining, whereas in the, in the periphery, this, this goes down. And you can see nicely the quantification showing that. And interestingly, we did our um, uh, analysis on the in vitro system with the stem cell derived pigment epithelium. And you see that the concentration has a role in correlating the forces and so to coordinating some kind of the, 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 the cells together. And this is completely independent from the traction again, supporting what we, we have shown in, in the migrating monolayer. Uh, so the take-home message is the cellular metrics by chemistry and not only mechanics, which is very much studied right now, define the epithelial system property and its mechanobiology. So you can imagine in development or healing, you have a, a, um, an isotropic uh, remodeling of metrics, which change the mechanics of the epithelia, but also can change the remodeling and therefore the movement. And you can think about cancer invasion in this, in this respect. Um, so uh, this work was done, uh, was started in the Max Planck Institute of, uh, in, uh, in Heidelberg. And I want to thank Joachim Spass, uh, the head of the, of the group, but also all my, uh, my colleagues, which was a great team studying collective semigration from Medavi, Jennifer, and Tamal. And Horst Kester was providing this pectinomimetics. And this is my group in here in Aachen, which were the uh, wonderful uh, young scientists that support my ideas and make them in uh, real data. And before finishing, I want to just share with you uh, the, uh, um, 
um, conference that I'm organizing in uh, co-organizing in Italy next year will be in presence. So that's the news. And uh, if you're interested in mechanobiology and you're interested to learn more from engineers, what tool you can use to address your question, uh, this is the best place to go for good food, nice sun and beautiful and good science. Thank you for the attention. Awesome, fantastic. And that conference looks like uh, it'll be pretty, pretty good. Um, let's, uh, Ankita, do you wanna ask the quest your question first? Sure, I'm taking the privilege. <laughs> um, so wonderful talk. I had a question regarding when you're saying that there's no coordination between the cells, uh, they're still generating some sort of, you know, stress in the leader cells. How are they doing that if they're not really coordinating with each other? So, you mean? I, I think it was at like 35, yeah. So how do they, 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 they develop here the stress? Yeah. So I think, I think that what I understood from what we, we did was like the each cell some sort of is independent. And so when you have an empty space, the cells are, are they're moving forward, right? So they're pulling mostly. And this is the actually what, what they're doing the, the first line. So they, I would think that each cells develop stress there, which is higher than the follower, basically. Mm -hmm. So they still have this identity of leader and follower cells, even without really, you think like without coordinating with each other. Yeah, so there are still leaders you can see here happening while migrating, right? But um, the, the whole basically area, they are increasing stress because of the empty space in front, basically which is higher than the follower. This is often the case, but it's a so sort of a different if you look at this case where uh, yeah. maybe here is not very clear, but you have higher stress at the leader maybe, but you have lower in general, more distributed stress on the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, we have a question from uh, Lucas Trzaskowski. Um, thank you for a very nice talk. And uh, in some cases of collective cell migration, it is observed that leader cells are swapped. So in your system, are you ever noticing this leader cell swapping? Yes. So um, maybe I, oops, maybe I, I show you this this to discuss that. So what we notice that uh, MDCK cells, for example, they have one leader and then you have this, this uh, kind of a tongue of cells coming out and then you have a second leader and it's much more controlled, the formation of leaders. Whereas in the HACAT cells, so in keratinocyte, you have one leader then then goes back and the next cell become a leader afterwards. So it's much more dynamic. And um, we think the reason is that uh, keratinocytes migrate in a 2D substrate also in vivo. So they are made for migrating 2D. And uh, the, the MDCK actually do tubular. So you can think about like uh, um, uh, endothelial cells when they make blood vessels, that's the same thing. You have a, a, um, a leader cells and a follower only. And so that remain kind of the order. So I think the MDCK are kind of programmed in this way. So that's the difference. Um, our next question, um, Ashris, if you want to unmute yourself and ask. Sure, yeah. Uh, great talk, Jacopo. Uh, I was just wondering about, uh, you, you have seen that the, there's this non-monotonic behavior between correlation lengths of stress versus the spacing of integrants. I was just yeah. curious about what is the mechanism behind that's causing it? Is, is, is it affecting how the tractions are being distributed spatially or uh, like... Because I was I was expecting that since thirty five nanometer could be more closer to the uniform distribution of uh, focal additions at the substrate, it would actually be. Uh, so we, yeah, yeah I, go ahead. I understood the, your your question. It's I I would love to know the answer actually because it's not clear completely yet. So we know okay. that focal addition, for example, density or size, is not following the same trend of correlation. So there is not a direct connection in that. Um, I think it's mostly connected to some kind of organization locally inside. So just just uh, inside basically the focal adhesion. So like can be acting, can be some signaling going on that it's differently regulated at different density. We have tried to, to, to understand this more 
in detail right now. So I cannot really tell you because uh, we don't know. Yeah. Would it would it be better if we if you like would would it be possible to check how the focalizations are distributed in a uniformly coated gel and see if that represents fifty nanometers more closely? And would that kind of give give an insight into that? Um. Yeah. The the the, the problem is that if you if you have a is an Maybe I understood. understood I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but if you if you have a gel with a fibronectin on top, right um, there, you have the contribution of many other interferons, okay. which obviously can control the the complexity of the focal adhesion. So um, the, the the beauty of this system is that you make it very simple and you try to reduce the variables. Yeah. But uh, this is something that we try to look, but it's um, it's difficult to to understand. From a very complex, let's say, addition on the full protein, which involve a lot of of uh, intermediate sector to single, um, let's say, dot, gold dots with uh, with an intervene. I mean, we are we are doing also uh, some experiment to understand more on other intermediate sector to see how we can learn from that, and this could be, for example, with the alpha v beta three in a different context. Yeah, and this this is the direction we are taking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Jinnah. She's I mean, wondering if the epi uh, retin retinal epithelial cells are jammed in the center while unjammed in the periphery. And That's, have you calculated uh, yeah. cell shape index or AR? Yes, we have. Um, I didn't share this because um, for, for, for interest of uh, you know, too many information, but uh, this is a very interesting question. So it's not clear why these are jammed and they are jammed. So the shape factor is actually reaching the, the this theoretical number, which is I think 3.8, it was published uh, by Lisa Manning, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, you have uh, unjamming going this towards the periphery. It's not, the problem is that it's not clear how much these cells are moving, for example. And there are very few reports showing that uh, cells from the periphery actually move to repopulate the cells in the center. And you have this kind of um, phenomena that uh, while aging, you have the same number of cells in the center and less in the periphery, even though the cells are not able to multiply and they just die, right? So there is a sort of movement, but it's it's a very un, um, unexplored and very uh, it's not understood yet. We are trying to to shine a light of this mechanism. We don't know yet, yeah. But it's a wonderful question, yeah. Awesome. Um, our next question is from Jessica Joel Tio. Uh, has two questions actually. Um, first, what is generating the increase in traction and stress behind the future leader cells? So we think it's random. So the the um, I sh I share with you this slide again. I think it's better to understand. So this um, is a, obviously one frame right, of how the stress and valley are distributed. But this is heterogeneous. So you have, uh, you have a, sorry, it's dynamic. So you continuously this stress will go up and down, and up and down. And so when you have a wound or you remove in our experiment, basically the physical uh, confinement, there at the moment you, where you have the high stress basically indicates the cells is ready to start. And when the leader is starting, so this, oops. So at this point, the leader is uh, is designed. So it, this cell is a leader, and then when it's starting, then it has its own domain of force and, and stress, which uh, block the others to become leader, like we've seen in, uh, in the other experiment. That's what we think is happening. Okay, great. And and then the uh, second question from Jessica, have you looked at the distance between the alpha-5, beta-1 integrins in the leaders versus the follower cells? Not yet. Great question. Not yet. Yeah, it's really, I mean, you really wonder, like, what is so special about that 50 nanometers? Um, you oh, know, yes. and, and I feel like there's a lot of these kind of uh, situations where the middle is the the, the, the key, the, the, the best, right? The, the right. That Linda Griffiths paper from like 20 years ago where they, they show that, you know, you need intermediate, I think it was stress. Um, 
to, to it's, it's, so it's just, it seems like another sort of fits into that, but, but there's something critical about 50 and, you know, is it a, is it a spacing that you see in vivo or, you know, do you guys have speculation on that? Just to sort we, of follow up on Jessica. Yes. We think question. that might be, there might be uh, the, the matrix organization at the nanoscale allows the, the addition of this receptor at this uh, distance. And also what I think is mostly the nano organization of the focal adhesion in, in order to best function in terms of integrin subtype has to have this kind of uh, um, distance, but we, we don't know yet what it is. Yeah, and, and um, I, I agree, but in vivo then you have, in the reality, you have much more, much many, so many others integral receptor. For example, you can also think about other structure like hemidesmosomes which are there and they are uh, um, contributing to the function of traction. So they're actually dumping down the traction in the focal adhesion. So what is the role of that part also in regulating maybe the spacing of focal adhesion in general? So this is all question that we have in mind. We are trying to focus on something and um, yeah, it's, it's a lot unknown. <laughs> yeah, and I think you have a really key point that when you have a uniform coding, you have so many different integrins that can be engaged. And so, you know, there may be a way for cells to have this sort of enormous plasticity and ability to respond to their environment because they have so many different overlapping systems all present at the same time that are tuned perhaps to different spatial sort of um, frequencies. Right. And so right. uh, it's really, really neat way to, um, to tease out some of the details here. Yes. I think that I think that was our last um, question uh, in the chat. Thank you, Ankita, for your message there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if anyone else wants to jump in with um, with last minute questions, otherwise I'll go ahead and end the YouTube live stream. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me go ahead and end that. So thank you everybody so much for being here. Um, we will see all of you next week.